Hey everybody, this isn't a video I ever envisioned I would ever make or watch. But before we get started, let me remind everybody of the differences between the red pill and the blue pill. The red pill is the uncomfortable, often painful and ugly truth. The blue pill is living the comfortable lie. Why is this basic reminder important? Well, it's because as masculine men, it's imperative we cultivate the emotional and psychological fortitude to fortify us in order to accept the truth when it presents itself, no matter how brutal or painful that truth actually is. Many of us can sometimes suffer from confirmation bias. Nobody's immune. Red-pilled masculine men committed to ethics and integrity will recover from confirmation bias quicker than others and accept verifiable facts and observable reality for what they really are, the truth. Even so, we all know the truth is brutal. Often, the most painful experience in our life is discovering we've been lied to or betrayed by a loved one. Whether it's a lover, a spouse, a close friend, or even a trusted business partner. One of my sayings is, trust but verify, always. However, in the manosphere, often the takeaway for too many is that this only applies to women. It doesn't. It applies to everyone. Men, women, and of course, the manginas who cosplay as red-pilled men who are in fact purple-pilled power bottoms. By the way, here's a bit of a spoiler alert. Many people think those who only accept part of the truth are purple pillars. They're not. They're blue pillars in denial. This is because the worst kind of lie is a half-truth. Self-identified purple pillars measure their ethics in half-truths. Remember, a half a truth is still a full lie. Why is this important? It's because the manosphere has a betrayer in our midst who, in October 2018, put hundreds of men's lives in real danger. While he may not have always been this way, his betrayal at the 2018-21 convention forever branded him as a betrayer of masculine men. What's worse is that when he was confronted with the verifiable facts, like a dishonest woman, he refused to admit his betrayal and seek redemption. This is not the conduct of a red-pilled man. This is the conduct of a dishonest cosplayer looking to shill his personal brand of half-truths while cultivating fanatical fanboys to feed his fragile ego. So, what exactly am I talking about? Well, I think the fraud father of the manosphere, Rolo Tomasi, says it best. Let's listen to what he has to say. All right, yeah, the Good Man Project are basically what I call Vici males. If you don't know what the word Vici means, look up the Vici French from World War II. They are the French that collaborated with the Nazis when they took over, when they invaded their country. Okay, so when I say a Vici male, what I mean is I mean men who have sort of sold themselves out to the, fem the Gestalt feminine. So people, you know, it's a convenient term, but that's what I mean when I'm talking about that. These are the guys who are the male feminists who are going to eventually have Me Too allegations thrown at them. Okay, so we've heard it from him himself, Vici male. Also, I should probably let you know that Anthony Johnson shared with me the private communications between he and Rolo Tomasi so that I could look at the facts of this situation and analyze the truth for myself. What you're seeing on the screen right now is the private time-stamped communications between Rolo Tomasi and Anthony Johnson that I was able to verify. And this was in ASCII text format provided me via Twitter. So these are actually Twitter DMs. So Rolo Tomasi on October 3rd, 2018 at approximately 2.44 p.m. stated to Anthony, Remember the girl who interviewed me for the New York Times article about the declining sperm count? First of all, doing a TRT story at last would love your help if you are still game. And I'd love to come out to the 21 convention, which is now so soon. Thinking it would be a great event to either write about or to meet people who have good future stories for me. Then he states, the gender situation and the general level of stress has only gotten more intense every month this year. It's amazing. Then he states, she says she'll fly out if she can get in. Now, what's the story that, that Rolo's talking about for the New York Times? It's this one here. The Dawning of Sperm Awareness by Nellie Bowles that was published on July 25th, 2018. So as you can see, Nellie Bowles has actually been talking to Rolo Tomasi 
since prior to July 25th of 2018. And apparently, she was at least talking with him about this particular article and maybe some things before that. Who knows? But you have to remember that Rolo is asking Anthony about this on the 3rd of October, 2018. So that's what, three, two and a half, three months later, something like that? So then Nellie contacts Anthony on October 7th, 2018 and states, First, I should apologize. I should have reached out your way from the get-go. I'd been talking to Rollo and had written about his work before, so I was asking about the convention through him. In other words, Rollo is this feminist reporter's media contact within the manosphere. That, I think, should send up some warning signs, but we're going to move on. And this is an email to Anthony on the 9th, two days after her initial email on the 7th. And just following up, my editors are down for me just coming Monday if that still works for you guys. Now remember, Monday is October 15th. So the convention, at least as I understand it, went from October 11th to October 14th. And she was coming down to speak to people at the convention on the 15th. Basically, as I understand it from what Anthony told me, is that she was going to be quarantined so she couldn't disrupt the convention itself. Now, with that said, Anthony publicly tweets, and this is on the 14th of October, the last day of the convention, looking forward to having Nellie Bowles from the New York Times talk with some of our 21 Con speakers tomorrow after the Red Man Group Live. Now, again, this confirms they were going to be meeting the Monday, October 15th. Now, the other side of this is, is that Rolo, during the convention, sent Anthony a text. This, I believe this is, I don't know, like iPhone communication or something. I don't mess with iCrap, but apparently they do. So whatever. It says, be sure you okay Nellie for Monday. She was hitting me up on my DM this morning. Okay. So apparently Nellie and Rolo are DMing each other either through text or through iPhone or whatever this messaging service is, whatever. Then Rolo asks Anthony on the night of October 13th, which is Saturday during the convention, should I invite Nellie to Sox party? And Anthony basically says no. Now, this is probably a joke, to be honest. I mean, I think he was just kind of being sarcastic here. So let's kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, in many things, Rolo seems to have opposable thumbs. So I don't think he was serious. But who knows? Maybe he was going to see how far he gets, you know? He was going to try his game on Anthony or something. But again, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and just assume he's joking. Just, you know, because the truth is damning enough. All right. So this right here is a screenshot from the 21 speaker chat. So the 21 convention speaker chat. And this is from Anthony Johnson. And this is the 14th, the last day of the convention at 1118 AM. And this can be verified by all the speakers if they choose to look at this Twitter chat. It's a private DM chat that the speakers were at for the 2018 21 convention. Anthony gave me access to it. Um, I signed an NDA, so I'm not disclosing any of the other information there. If I did, Anthony could sue me into the Stone Ages, but I have his permission to share this. It states, New York Times chick is allowed to show up tomorrow only, Monday at 2 p.m. under tight supervision. She does not get the address until 1 p.m. Monday. Okay, so Anthony's keeping the information about the 21 convention completely compartmentalized. He's trying to protect the men who attended. He is trying to protect his speakers. And of course, he's trying to protect the venue. This makes perfect sense and it is consistent with everything that's happened so far. Now, I haven't shown all the screenshots that I have. I haven't shown all the information I have, but everything I've seen so far basically confirms that Rolo approached Anthony to get Nellie Bowles into the convention. Initially, Anthony said no. And then he said, okay, after it's over, we can do a kind of a quarantine situation to protect everybody. And then this way she can't just party crash. Now, think about that for a moment. Now, on the night of the 14th, There was a social gathering after the event, and it was at a location in downtown Orlando. Rolo reaches out to Anthony via this text message at 9.39 p.m. on Sunday and says, where's the party? And then Anthony tells him it's some kind of cigar bar, if you kind of see. Apparently, my uh, blackout game needs help. So there you go. But it was some kind of cigar bar someplace. So anyway, you'll know that it's a cigar bar because here is the private gathering right here. Okay. This is the video of it. And we just kind of bounce around a little bit. You can see her there. There's Nellie Bowles and people are like, you know, they're sitting outside. I don't know. Maybe it's something here, but there's, you know, people sitting here and they're, they're smoking. 
So maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a bar or something. There's Rich Cooper. So there he goes. He actually looks like a man. The transition's going pretty well. Anyway, um, there he is again. So, um, but yeah. Oh, and look, that looks like, is that Rolo? Is that Rolo? Look, he's, he's like, he's like sitting back, like trying to figure out the hell's happening. Interesting. So anyway, we move on and Anthony and Nelly had some conversation back and forth that culminates with Nelly saying, uh, genuinely, Anthony, someone in your group invited me and told me to come just now. I'm so sorry. It felt like I was crashing. That was in no way at all my intention. Then she goes on and states, I was invited to that evening session by Rolo. He said that five of the 21 con guys wanted to meet and chat off the record before the next day's on record interviews. I asked if he was sure. He said, yes, I have all these DMs and have sent them to Anthony. After all this happened and after Rolo docks the location and this unfortunate confrontation occurred, Anthony and 21 Convention put out a 15 page statement that included the video that I just showed and many of the texts that are here. I'm just going to kind of go through this real quick. There's some texts that are here. I'm just kind of scrolling through. That way you can kind of see this is on Scrib. This link will be in the description of the video. More text. Look at us. We're texting again. Lots of texts. And of course, you know, look, you can reward your curiosity if you want to buy Scrib because, you know, they got to show themselves. But, you know, whatever. Um, and then we're going to move on. Now, the reason that this is important is because leftists have been attacking people for a while, and it's been getting more and more violent. This is Jeremy Hambly. He runs the YouTube channel, The Quartering. This guy doesn't threaten anybody, ever. However, he was assaulted at a bar one night after Gen Con, after somebody found out who he was. He needed three people to pull off of his attacker. Now, to Jeremy's credit, um, I've actually met him. The man's six foot five. So when you need three people to pull somebody off of you when you're six foot five, you know that that guy is an absolute danger to your life. In addition to that, everybody remembers how Antifa brought in what appears to be possibly thousands of people to harass Milo at Berkeley. And then on top of that, somebody decided to load child porn on Alex Jones' computer and then try to blame him for it. Again, these are leftists. These are people trying to deplatform people, telling the truth. And even if I don't agree with everything Alex Jones says, I don't think that he should be the victim of this type of crime or any other crime. And then on top of that, Roosh V, back, I want to say this is 2000, yeah, 2015, Roosh V got stalked when he tried to come out with his neo masculinity movement and he got beer thrown in his face as a result. And then recently, since the 2016 election, Breitbart has recorded 639 cases of media-approved violence and harassment against Trump supporters. Let's call this what it is. This is national origin discrimination. This is terrorism. These are hate crimes committed by anti-American leftists. These are people who do not support the freedom of speech. These are people who do not support the Second Amendment. And they definitely don't support due process under the law. What they support is witch hunting and violence. Period. Now, the reason this is a concern is because Anthony is often seen with his trademark hat, Make Women Great Again. Now, prior to wearing this particular hat, Anthony used to wear the MAGA hat, Make America Great Again. Now, you can do a quick internet search and you can find that there are multiple instances of people wearing a hat that looks almost exactly like this who are the victims of unprovoked violence. And then on top of all that, remember last year when Tucker Carlson had his home under siege from Antifa? Well, this year, Antifa plastered posters around Washington, D.C. with Tucker Carlson's address as a warning after attacking his home last year. They practically broke his door down. They terrorized his wife and his children. Why? Because they didn't like the news he was reporting. So when you dox the confidential location of a male gathering, especially if it's a healthy red pill male gathering to a feminist journalist, or anybody else for that matter, you are putting those men in danger. So the problem with Vici voices in the manosphere, like cosplay Tomasi, is that in their own narcissism and hubris, they justify betraying not only the men who follow them, but the men who considered them close and trusted friends. There is no worse sin 
than betrayal. When Rollo betrayed the trust and confidentiality of his fellow 21 convention speakers and the men who paid to attend that event, he actually put them in physical danger from feminist bigots, Antifa, and social justice warriors. Tomasi's betrayal could have gotten these men who trusted him fired from their jobs, destroyed their careers, subjected them to doxing, and caused them to be ostracized from their communities and their families alike. Tomasi's backdoor relationship with this feminist New York Times reporter put every man associated with the 2018-21 convention in harm's way. For her part, the New York Times reporter Nellie Bowles, from the evidence I've seen, at all times acted in good faith and extremely professionally, which is something I cannot say for Rolo Tomasi himself. However, as a feminist reporter who has a history of opposing masculine male teachings from strong male voices like Jordan P. Peterson, she could have brought Antifa or armed violent social justice warriors to bear. If that had happened, then the late night confrontation that Anthony recorded could have gone far differently. If this fraud father were half the red pilled man he cosplays, then he would have never put innocent men's lives in danger and would have immediately apologized to his fellow 21 convention speakers and the attendees publicly as well as accepted complete responsibility for his conduct. Instead, Rollo and those around him have focused on defamation, lying, and attempting to conceal Rollo's unethical betrayal of those who trusted him. Remember, trust but verify always, and never, ever forgive anyone, man or woman, who refuses to accept responsibility for unethical conduct, especially when it puts innocent men's lives in danger. Were I Anthony Johnson, I'd sue Rollo and those around him into the Stone Ages for their efforts to destroy the Red Man Group, the 21 Convention, and their attempted character assassination of Anthony Johnson personally. I'm DDJ, and this Bukaki Chokeslam is your dose of misandry today.